When you think about the average favorite animal, your brain probably goes to something cute, fluffy, very squeezable things. Cats and bunnies and panda bears. But most animals don't fit that category. Some, rather than cute, are metal as fuck, as in very sick and cool, have superhero-like qualities, and make you question the true limits of what animals are capable of. Animals are diverse. So today I want to focus on those that are purely metal as fuck. So buckle up, because I have not one, not two, not three, not four, not five. I guess we'll never know. Metal as fuck animals come in a variety of shapes and sizes in taxonomic groups, so I don't have a general information section to get out of the way. But I did figure out a way to categorize some of them as if they are weapons. Weapons are typically made out of metal, keeping in line with the metal as fuck theme of this video. But I want to clarify that I don't think combat and warfare are metal as fuck. They just objectively, typically, include some sort of metal. The first category of metal as fuck animals is close combat. Animals that are metal as fuck in a close range distance. Exhibit A, the Iberian ribbed newt, an amphibian from, you guessed it, the Iberian Peninsula that can get to about a foot long. At first glance, this newt looks basic, nothing to write home about, but your eyes deceive you once again, because this newt has blades that rip through its skin as defense. Those blades? They're ribs. They rotate their ribs forward and out and pow, rip through venomous glands in their skin, creating built-in, certified, lethal weapons. This is quite alarming. I know, how could anybody see this coming? Well, the newt's secret weapons aren't totally hidden. They have these rows of orange spots running down the side of their body. Those are where the ribs come out, where the toxic substance is stored. And the ribs aren't coming out of pores, dude. They're ripping the skin each time. Ripping it, boom, venom, boom, toxic meal. Imagine picking up one of these newts for a quick snack, pop it in your mouth, boom, turns into what probably feels like a fucking sea urchin. Then you've got a mouthful of venom and some of it probably seeping into wounds. That would suck. Probably make you want to spit it out. First, back to the fact that they rip the skin each time. You might be thinking, how is this not a honeybee scenario where they die after they use their weapon? The answer is amphibians are weird as fuck. They can regenerate to shit and quickly. Amphibians can often regenerate limbs, parts of their brain, and even some organs. So in the case of the rib ripping newt, this means very little chance of getting an infection, a very solid chance of being able to do this over and over and over again, so long as the defense actually works. I wanna give a quick shout out to this article I found called Newt's Use Ribs As Lethal Weapons, in all caps and the picture that goes along with it. This is sick. This is a sick scientific article. It also added that along with the fact that the newts can heal their wounds quickly, the ribs are also coated in a thick, kind of nourishing layer that probably also protects them from infections. Very badass, very metal as fuck. Some may say similar to Wolverine, until you meet the Wolverine frog. Yes, another amphibian, and this one is even more like Wolverine, actually extremely on the nose. Blades in the hands, which are actually, you guessed it, their bones. Not just any bones, broken bones. They break their bones, rip them out of the skin, and boom, Wolverine. They can scratch their enemies to a deep degree. Also, when they're ready to mate, males become hairy or seemingly hairy, which is extremely Wolverine. That hair is not actually hair though, due to the fact that they are amphibians. No. Instead, those hair-like projections are extremely long strands of flesh filled with blood vessels. They're used to collect more oxygen through their skin while they watch over their developing children. Don't have to go up for air as much. Very convenient when you have tens, if not hundreds, if not thousands of children you're responsible for. I also realized as I'm saying this that maybe Wolverine is based on the Wolverine frog. Probably not. Sometimes I say stuff and then there's comments that are like, oh, well, it was actually based off this character and I don't know shit like that. So I don't think Wolverine was based off this frog. I think it's just a coincidence, but maybe it was. Maybe if somebody could clarify in the comments, that would be very appreciated. Back to the bones and how they go about breaking them. Inside of their toes, the tips of the terminal phalanges are not fused to the rest of the toe skeleton. So when threatened, the frog contracts muscles in its feet and the blades break free from these nodules they're attached to and rip through the skin of its toe pads. This defense is unexpected, so effective. Early reports of handling them in the 1950s mentioned deep bleeding wounds on the researchers. That's to a human being. Imagine how much they could fuck up a predatory bird. After the threat has been eliminated, the wolverine frog's bone blades go back into their original place. And as you would expect from an amphibian, the skin and connection to the nodules are healed very quickly via regeneration. They are totally cool and totally metal as fuck. Now we're moving away from close combat into more long range combat, relatively long range combat, starting off with the horned lizard found in deserts in North America. There's about 20 species and many of them have a very sick defense. They squirt blood out of their eyes. Yeah, but, ooh, what's that? Can't get more metal than that. So, ha. Horned lizards have blood filling their sinuses all around their eyes. So when they get threatened, they restrict blood flow from the head, which increases the pressure in these sinuses until the tiny vessels burst, releasing a stream of blood. Somehow they have 
very accurate aim. They can squirt blood up to five feet away and are able to target the mouths and eyes of their attackers. And this is not just a sick, disgusting prank. The blood is toxic. Yeah. It turns out the lizards eat a very large amount of venomous ants. Their digestive system is adapted to neutralize the ants' venom so they don't get hurt, but then they're able to take it a step further and incorporate the venom into their blood. Kind of like the aeolid nudibranchs to some degree, literally spraying venomous blood out of their eyes. That is unfathomably metal. They're so metal, they're alkali. Chemists, let me know if that makes sense in the comments, because I think alkali is like the most metalist metal. So I think that makes sense in terms of chemistry and chemical elements. All right, the next one on the list is kind of in the same long range combat category, I guess, but also combined with explosives. Allow me to introduce you to the bombardier beetle. They create boiling, toxic chemical compounds inside of their bodies and project them out at their enemies, literally shitting out explosives as defense. Let me break it down. What? So at any typical moment, the bombardier beetle has two reservoirs of chemicals in their abdomen. One contains hydroquinone and the other contains hydrogen peroxide on their own, fine. When threatened, these chemicals get mixed together in a reaction chamber inside of their bodies and create a superheated mixture of benzoquinone, a pungent and poisonous chemical compound. We all had that chemistry teacher in high school that wasn't all there and would make insane little explosions in their beakers. Actually, probably not all there because of all the fucking explosions. But I'm sure you remember how just two liquids that's four. Two liquids. We get all pressurized and freak out. That's exactly what happens inside the bodies of the bombardier beetles. And that pressure forces the liquid out of the nearest exit, i.e. a valve at the tip of their abdomen with a popping sound in a pulsating jet that can reach up to 22 miles per hour. It's a pulsating jet rather than a long stream so the reaction chamber can cool off and the beetle doesn't fucking combust in the process. This one, I think, feels harder to imagine in an evolutionary context. How the fuck did this happen? Well, as I've said many times, and will say many times more, there are a a shit ton of beetles, over 350,000 species of beetles that we know of, and they make up about 25% of all animal species. All animal species do. So with that much diversity in just one group, it's not surprising that some of them just went totally sci-fi. Tons of beetles have chemical defenses. I've mentioned my experience with blister beetles. I'll spray you with this liquid that will leave blisters on you for weeks. Some ground beetles do this thing called reflex bleeding, where toxic liquid seeps out of their legs when threatened. Other beetles have other toxic liquids that seep out of other parts of their body. Beetles have been all about toxic liquids and seeping toxic liquids for a very long time. So those chemical compounds have been part of the beetle lineage for millions of years. And that's what led to these particular chemicals being able to be combined and react in the bombardier beetle's bodies. Bombardier beetle's bodies. Bombardier beetle's bodies. If you think about it, all the beetles need is the presence or development of the chemicals and the ability to not be harmed by them. The chemical reaction and explosion and pressure is what would happen between these chemicals in whatever environment they get combined in. So it's in a body, gets combined in a body. Just gotta make sure the body can deal with it. Am I making any sense? And as you would expect, this defense works wonders. They can spray the liquid up to about 20 times before running out of fuel. And with the right size predator, that is a lethal attack. A toad, perhaps. A study back in 2018 found that bombardier beetles that are swallowed by toads have almost a 50% survival rate because the toads turn their stomachs inside out, throw up the beetles when they realize what they've done. All in all, a very cool beetle. Now we're moving on to a new category. Still kind of in a warfare context, but more of a war crime. Allow me to introduce you to the Shrike, a type of songbird found all over the world. I know, this seems like such a simple little guy. Don't be fooled by those chubby cheeks. This bird is barbaric. They skewer their prey to thorns, branches, or barbed wire in order to take down prey seemingly larger than possible, earning them the nickname Butcher Birds. Like I said, they're very unassuming. They look like a simple, typical songbird. Big heads, but very small overall. Very cute. There's one feature that hints at their sinister ways. Those black mask markings over their eyes. Likely to reduce glare in their eyes while hunting, but also identifies them as sly criminals. Another thing they have is hooked bills, similar to birds of prey, the kind of birds they strive to be. Like the whole lion inside every house cat thing. Birds of prey are much more equipped to take down their kills. They have those sharp talons to grasp and immobilize. The Shrike could only dream of talent. So instead, in order to achieve their dreams of being one of the greats, they use sharp objects. Impaling has the dual purpose of grasping and immobilizing things, like talents, but it also creates a supply of food for later on. No need to eat it now. The kebab is probably not going anywhere. As long as they have access to a sharp object, they can take down anything they can get skewered onto it. Insects, other vertebrates, even other birds. In the most extreme cases, ducks and pigeons. This little guy is taking down ducks and pigeons. That's metal as fuck. But of course you have to have skill to impale something if you're a tiny bird. The way they do it is by grasping their prey by the neck with their hooked beak, pinch the spinal cord to paralyze them, and shake them violently with the power of up to six G-forces, enough to break the neck of a small rodent. Then 
the prey is fucked. Nowhere to go. Obviously, they're paralyzed. That's when they get skewered. To me, this is sick and metal as fuck. Not only is this tiny bird capable of much more than you'd expect, but they're also using tools. And any animal that uses tools is cool. I like this bird a lot. I like how small they are and also how they look. Actually, I guess they kind of look like the tiny orcas of the bird world. Maybe their orcas reincarnated as tiny birds. The last one on the list is metal as fuck in a totally different way. In a truly literal way. Meet the volcano snake. A mollusk that lives near hydrothermal vents and builds its shell out of iron, literally metal as fuck. The snail was first found back in 2001 at the first hydrothermal vents identified in the Indian Ocean. As you probably know, hydrothermal vents have all sorts of minerals spewing out of them. It's probably where life originated and life still exists there today. Organisms near the vents use these minerals to survive. It's the only way how. It's the fucking deep sea. But this snail was different. The iron shell was a shock and it became a sensation immediately. Like a six year old who can play piano on the Ellen show. It had hundreds of these scale shaped exoskeletal structures made of iron sulfides all over its foot. That big fleshy part they used to move around. Same function as our foot, locomotion, in a very different font. Its shell was made of these same iron sulfides, making it the first and only animal to use iron in its skeleton that we know of. Most animals with shells and exoskeletons in the ocean use calcium carbonate to get it done. Calcium and carbonate ions are all over the place. Easy to extract, easy to use, seemingly unlimited supply. So it's not crazy that an animal would use a different material that's abundant in their unusual environment. Iron. Iron, iron, and iron, iron. Which makes this animal a certified metal as fuck free. And that was the last one on the list. I hope you enjoyed it. Just so you know, to keep you up to date, I'm gonna be doing a little bit of redecorating. Not too much. I'm gonna be moving this to a different wall. So I think I'm gonna keep the same thing going on. I like the plant over there. I'm probably gonna put the base back if it fits. I'm gonna keep the big whiteboard. I'm gonna keep all this stuff too. But if you have any suggestions, on maybe some things that you would like to see me add to my backdrop, let me know. I wanna figure out how to put up the smiling on skull somewhere, but it might just like not look right on camera, you know? It might have to be like here, and obviously you can't go there because of the whiteboard or the picture frame, whatever. I'm not gonna be using this microphone anymore because um, somebody, my editor, wants me to use a different type of mic. So I gotta figure that out, which kinda sucks because I've gotten used to it but I'll get used to this one, it's fine. <laughs> this will probably be the same, but just in a slightly different area because it's going to a slightly different wall. It's the era of redecorating. So I will see you then. And if you like this video, be sure to subscribe so you don't miss the first episode of the history of cats that we know of. I don't know what it's gonna be called yet, but that's the general gist. It's the history of cats that we know of. That's coming out next week. I think. Keep up with behind the scenes content and live streams on Patreon, where we also have a Discord server. And for now, stay curious. The world has a lot for us to learn. See ya!